All right, here's the story. It has now been nearly three years since we first heard about DeForest Johnson, a 49-year-old man who has sat on Alabama's death row for 24 years, despite strong evidence that he is innocent. That report that we heard about a year ago, or three years ago, persuaded former Alabama Attorney General Bill Baxley to take a deeper look at the case. He later signed an amicus brief and wrote his own op-ed at the Washington Post. Both documents called for Mr. Johnson's conviction to be overturned. At least 14 former judges and prosecutors also have called for Johnson's conviction to be overturned, including two former state Supreme Court justices in Alabama, a former president of the Alabama State Bar, the current district attorney from the county where Mr. Johnson was convicted, and remarkably, even the man who prosecuted Mr. Johnson. Three of the jurors who convicted Johnson have also now said they believe they were wrong. But as of this moment, Mr. Johnson is still on Alabama's death row. Johnson was convicted in 1998 for the 1995 murder of Jefferson County Deputy William Hardy. The investigation of Hardy's murder was a mess. Police and prosecutors meandered from suspect to suspect, pressured and threatened witnesses, and dangled reward money for incriminating testimony. In the end, prosecutors focused on Johnson and his friend, Adragus Ford, even though both had alibis. But both men were promised leniency if they'd impl implicate the other. Both refused, insisting that neither had anything to do with the murder. The two were arrested because of statements from a teenage girl who was with them on the night of the murder. But that girl continually changed her story often after threats from police, as their theories, the police theories about the crime, continues to evolve. At Ardragus Ford's trial, prosecutors conceded that the girl had lied at least 300 times. Another witness who implicated Mr. Ford said the police had threatened to take away her children. And yet another witness who refused to implicate the men was locked up in juvenile detention for nearly a year because the police didn't believe her. Mr. Johnson and Mr. Ford were tried separately, and at each trial, prosecutors offered a theory of the crime that directly contradicted what they argued at the other trial. Only Mr. Johnson was convicted. He was sentenced to death. The only real evidence against Johnson came from a woman who claimed to overhear a phone conversation in which she said a man identifying himself as Mr. Johnson confessed to the crime. But in 2003, Johnson's attorneys learned that this witness had been paid $5,000 for her testimony. That was never disclosed to the defense and prosecutors wouldn't turn over a copy of the check for another 16 years. In May of this year, the Alabama Court of Criminal Appeals ruled against Mr. Johnson. You see, under Alabama law, it isn't enough that the key witness against Mr. Johnson was paid and that this was never disclosed. The burden is on Johnson to prove that the witness testified only because of the reward. The court ruled that Mr. Johnson, on death row, had failed to do so. There were other problems with Johnson's trial. His attorney had no death penalty experience and expressed reservations to the trial judge about taking the case. And due to a lack of funds, that attorney could afford only a down-on-his-luck, unlicensed investigator whom Johnson's current attorneys describe as an alcoholic, a racist, and a suicidal man who was homeless at the time and had recently been fired 
from a previous capital case for incompetence. That investigator failed to investigate Johnson's alibi that he was at a club on the other side of Birmingham at the time of the murder. Mr. Johnson's attorneys have since found 10 eyewitnesses who placed him at that club. Despite all this, and despite the growing list of former Alabama officials speaking out on Johnson's behalf, there's a notable lack of urgency among the current state officials, those who have the power to do anything about this. Alabama Governor Kay Ivey has yet to show any interest in Johnson's case. And when a local TV station recently asked Alabama Attorney General Steve Marshall about Johnson's case, Marshall replied, quote, We've seen the appeal most recently be upheld by the Alabama Court of Criminal Appeals. Much of the narrative that we see, those that are advocating on behalf of this defendant, were disproven in court. End quote. That isn't true. The Alabama Court of Criminal Appeals didn't rule on Johnson's innocence. It ruled on the narrow question of whether the trial court erred in finding the state's failure to turn over evidence of the payment to one witness was a violation of Johnston's constitutional rights. But the public is often ignorant of the details of any complex case, and that gives politicians such as Mr. Marshall, the Alabama Attorney General, cover to brush aside the very real possibility that the state is preparing to execute an innocent man. Both federal and state appeals courts have ruled that once a case progresses as far as Johnson's, the court's obligation is to protect the finality of jury verdicts. Prisoners must show overwhelming evidence of innocence to get relief. Lesser claims, they argue, are better handled by the political process, by appealing to attorneys general to drop charges or to governors to grant clemency. So, the courts pass the buck to the politicians. Well, politicians like Mr. Marshall claim that if prisoners like Johnson were really innocent, well, the courts would have freed them. Meanwhile, every month of delay is a month Mr. Johnson could have lived outside of prison, reclaiming the time and freedom unjustly taken from him. He's not white. He's a black man. But like I say, you probably already figured that out, right? I mean, after all, it is Alabama. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, with enough public pressure, perhaps the political process can free a man that the Alabama criminal justice system has pushed to the edge of madness. Think about this for just a second. You're partying at a club. You're dancing and whooping and hollering, having drinks, maybe going out in the alley and smoking a bit of weed and, and, and just having a great time. All of a sudden, a couple days later, police come and arrest you, charge you with murder, somehow get a jury to convict you, sentence you to death, and for the next 24 years... 24 years. You're locked into a cell on death row in Alabama. And think, if you will, for a moment, my white brothers and sisters, black folk, you don't need to pay any attention to this because you can, you can certainly feel empathy for the subject of my Uncle Mike Story Corner. But I'm talking about us white folk. Because, see, here's the thing, and, and I put myself at the top of this heap. We, white people, can not imagine 
although it may happen once in a while, very infrequently. We cannot imagine being sentenced to death for a crime we didn't commit. I mean, what the fuck? We're white. And then being locked up for 24 years? No, 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 no. Doesn't happen, except in extremely rare cases. But I would ask my members of my white tribe, just like I asked myself, I'm not separating myself from my whiteness. But I would ask members of my white tribe, how many times do you and I read about a, sto- a story like this in, in the papers where we see some man, some black man now with, with grayish hair, skinny, coming out of a prison someplace in the South, met by his family members, the ones that haven't died, and then we get the rest of the story that this man has been in fucking prison for 40 years and he didn't do anything. Or this one's been locked on death row for 15 years. He didn't do anything. Or the case of Mr. Johnson here. 24 years on death row. Now, I would hazard a guess that you and I have never been in a cell on death row, even as a visitor. The closest I ever came was when I was a writer here in Atlanta working for a local newspaper, and I did an expose on jail conditions of the Atlanta City Jail, which was a fucking mess at the time. I'm going back 50 years almost, 45 years. And to do the story, I went into the uh, Atlanta City Jail, into, you know, what, what was a cell where people were held sometimes for months on end waiting for their case to come up in Atlanta court, city court or Fulton County court. And I remember the first time I ever walked into one of those cells, I, well, how to explain it? Um, a sense of anxiety, of, of terror just swept over me because I realized so many people in the criminal justice system in Atlanta, in Georgia, in the South, in the United States, a place like this shithole becomes their home for God knows how long. And here I was, white boy, walking in, taking my notes, looking around, yada, 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 and walking out. And since most of us white folk never will have experienced long jail sentences for crimes we did not commit or for crimes we did commit. That's the horror of it. Black folk understand this. They understand this. Oh, well, uh, uh, this guy, Leroy Johnson or uh, Willie Smith, you know, pick a black sounding name. Um, Okay, he wasn't on death row. He didn't kill anybody. No, he was he was convicted of, of, of dealing drugs. Now, the fact that Our imaginary black man was innocent. It's beside the point. It doesn't mean shit. Once a jury convicts you, bro, you got to prove you are innocent. Wait a minute. I I thought it was innocent until proven guilty. Well, yeah, but once a a jury convicts you of, 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 of the crime, then you're no longer innocent until proven guilty. You're guilty until proven innocent. Isn't that a mind fuck right there? I mean, that little bit right there. You're guilty unless you prove yourself innocent. Yeah, but you're locked up. Well, details, details. I have no moral of the story here. I I just wish I and my white tribe members could be more willing to listen to stories like this Because there's nothing we can do about what has happened. But listen to stories like this so that we can elect people who will pass laws that will prevent this from happening again and again and again to our black cousins. Hi, Truth Seekers. Mike Malloy here. As you know, we've switched formats and are now broadcast exclusively on the Progressive Voices Network. So that means you get fewer program interruptions, no corporate commercials, and lots of profanity. 
But our format change also means some of our radio listeners no longer hear the program. It's been a while since I mentioned our podcasts, so you may have forgotten that there is a way to listen to this program anytime you need a good dose of screaming. Visit MikeMalloy.com and subscribe to our podcast. As a podcast subscriber, you can download the program to your mobile device and take me with you wherever you go. And if you have a friend who needs a dose of truth-seeking, you can give a gift subscription as well. That's MikeMalloy.com. And never miss a minute of the uncensored fun and frivolity.